This video is sponsored by Dragon Shield, your destination for the best sleeves, deck boxes, and accessories in the multiverse. Purchases through the affiliate link below help the channel grow and improve. Alara once was whole, but long ago the Sundering shattered the plane into five shards that drifted just beyond each other's reach. As the shards migrated, they slowly took on new shape, new life, new order. Mana ley lines were severed, denying each shard access to two colors of mana, which allowed those remaining to surge unfettered. One such shard lost its connection to white mana. Order dissolved, unity forgotten, benevolence faded. It lost the depth of thought, the cold intellect and acumen of blue mana also, which worked to mold the shard into a primordial and dangerous world, where lava flows scorched trails through stifling humid jungles and bottomless tar pits drag the unsuspecting to dark deaths. It's a shard of heat and hunger, of instinct and dominance ruled only by the laws of nature, where dragons soar and predators lurk. This is the Shard of Jund. Jund is defined by its savagery. It's a world where everything, even the very land, is hostile and the creatures that dwell within are at all times predator and prey. The Shard of Jund is shaped primarily through its strong connection to red mana. Unfiltered passion, raw violence, and fierce fire are further heightened by support from green and black mana. These powers intertwine to devastating effect played out across its landscape. Rugged mountain peaks extend rocky hands ever skyward, while active volcanoes constantly belch sulfurous ash and lava eats away at the earth to form deep valleys. This is displayed in the planar card of Jund. Within these, rivers choked with algae support steaming jungle canopies. Primal forests are dotted haphazardly with toxic swamps that lie stagnant. These vistas are constantly shifting, constantly being shaped by the impetus of deadly renewal deep within the shard. But Jund is defined as easily by what it lacks. Order, restraint, forethought, control, all vestiges of blue and white mana that have long since faded from the shard's memory. Without these higher ideals, Jund is reduced to primal urges. It's at the whim of instinct. It's creatures, unable to develop beyond cultural and intellectual infancy. Nature and survival reign. But by the same token, a shard without these colors is refreshingly free. Jund isn't chained to compassion. It's not a prisoner to the mind. It's creatures liberated from oppression and conformity. A sentiment typified by Sarkhan Val, who in the flavor text of Hellkite Overlord states, the dragon has no pretense of compassion, no false mask of civilization, just hunger, heat, and need. The beings that claim Jund as their own reflect the hostile topography. They've adapted well to their environs out of necessity, fiery as the volcanic mountains, strong as the forest boughs, deadly as the fetid swamps, Jund's creatures are aggressively lethal. From the largest dragon to the smallest insect, all are deadly as the flavor text of Toxic Iguana reads, there are no weak creatures on Jund. Even the smallest can strike a deadly blow. Though Jund has no leaders or kings, it is ruled quite strictly through the laws of nature. Those who deviate don't survive. An elaborate food chain, a primal pecking order grants structure to Jund's ecosystem. To fully understand the shard, we must scrutinize and appreciate the beasts found at each level, beginning at the top, with the insatiable Hellkites and unstoppable dragons of Jund. As a marquee creature of red mana, it's little wonder that dragons have flourished along the ley line suffusing Jund. With wings that span dozens of meters, bodies covered in thick scales, piercing teeth the size of humans and breath of liquefying fire, dragons are the apex predators. They embody raw strength and the will to use it. All other creatures fear the dragon, and only another of its kind can rival its destructive potential. Jun's dragons are territorial and vicious. They lay claim to land with molten fire, carving out large swaths over which they hunt and rule. Once taken, a dragon will only relinquish its lands through death. The card Flame Blast Dragon illustrates the beauty and destruction of these miraculous creatures. Its flavor text reading, He marks his territory with fire and wrath, etching the mountainside, with his charring breath. All beings fear the dragon, but born from this fear, or perhaps an appreciation for the marriage of strength and passion, is a cult-like following of devotees. 
worshippers wishing to spare their lives through supplication or to receive divine gifts from their overlords. The goblin clans of Jun worship dragons from high atop mountain peaks in hopes of basking in draconic freedom, which we can see in cards like Dragon Appeasement and Dragon's Herald. But the grace of a dragon is fickle at best, non-existent at worst. Their contempt even for the devoted is on display in the illustration of Predator Dragon, whose flavor text reads, Dragons make for spiteful gods. Dragons build their roosts on the highest summits and within burning volcanoes. From the vaulted heights they survey their hunting grounds with dedicated vigilance. There's little treasure on Jun to hoard, but dragons seek the mystical crystals known as Sangrite for its luster and magical potential for much devastation. Intrepid human hunting parties brave draconic lairs to abscond with this rare crystal. When a dragon approaches its final days following a long, brutish and violent life, it performs one last act of destruction through a ritual known as the Shriek of Flame. They willingly plunge themselves into the boiling lava of an active volcano, merging their essence with that of the fire and stoking a white-hot blast of energy that consumes not just the dragon, but all within a large radius. This suicidal and spiteful act of mutual destruction renders a dragon's valued hunting grounds denuded of game and ensures no rival will claim it. This act is showcased in the card Volcanic Submersion. Its text reads, A dragon's death is almost as feared as its life. Old, dying dragons throw themselves into volcanoes, causing massive upheaval and widespread disaster. Many believe all eruptions to be propagated by a dragon's death. Though Jund is a wild land free from thought, there are several sentient races populating its jungles. The humanoid reptilian Viashino are one such race, and sit below the dragon on the food chain, their form reminiscent of those soaring creatures. Viashino are tall, well-muscled, and dangerously aggressive. Though their razor-sharp talons can fillet flesh and their jaws crush steel, many Viashino fight with crude spears and cudgels used to bludgeon foes. We see this illustrated in Viashino Slaughtermaster as it wields two weapons adeptly, the flavor text of which highlights their disposition. I'll fight two at once and then lick their guts from my blades. Viashino are communal pack creatures. They organize themselves into clans known as thrashes to improve hunting ability and ensure higher rates of survival in inhospitable environments. As the flavor text of Thunder Thrash Elder states, Viashino are led by elders and veterans of many battles their acumen and experiential knowledge used to guide clans. Viashino range within the fertile vegetated canyons of Jund, where a dragon's wings can't spread and their fire can't reach. Lizards called iguanars accompany Viashino on hunting sorties to track and trap prey, which we can see in the card Hissing Iguana. Notable thrashes include the aforementioned Thunder Thrash, the Violent Warriors of the Thorn Thrash, and the Fiery Shamans of the Scorched Thrash. Just as territorial as dragons, Jun's Viashino constantly raid another's borders, test leadership, and challenge another in bloody war to assert dominance. Below the Viashino thrashes sit the sentient race of human barbarians and shamans that sojourn across Jun's topography. Denied the assurance of such base needs as shelter, food, safety, Jun's human population spends all waking hours focused on mere survival which has stunted both intellectual and technological advancement. Here, humans are simple and barbaric, ruled by primal instinct, shaped by superstition. They form nomadic bands of warriors tied by familial blood bonds. Constantly mobile in search of quarry and shelter, humans often trek long distances which brings them into conflict with another, as well as Jun's dangerous creatures. Strong leadership is a necessity and only the most ruthless battle-hardened warriors are deemed fit enough to lead barbarian clans. Humans actively seek adversity, engaging in war to hone skill and slake thirst for blood. Entire clans endeavor on great hunting treks called life hunts to fell Jun's largest predators. Not even dragons are above human bloodlust, and though they are respected, they are equally hunted, which we hear in the flavor text of Rip Clan Crasher. If you breathe, she will fight you. If you breathe fire, she must fight you. Jund warriors are bolstered by the stirring fire and lightning magic of its shamans. Their powerful incantations are used to incite zealous bloodlust before battle and to direct the primordial forces of nature abundant across the shard. By drawing on the ley lines, human shamans can invigorate growth, spread biting pestilence, 
hurl balls of fire and electricity, and bring forth elementals, manifestations of dangerous power. We see the potential for destruction on display in the illustration of Branching Bolt, and in the ability of Rakamar, Jun's most prodigious shaman, to generate elementals. Her words extolling the skills of shamans are given in the flavor text of the aforementioned Bolt. Lightning lives in everything, in living flesh and growing things. It must be set free. Jun's barbaric humans are divided into various clans and subfactions that wage constant war on another and their environment to maintain precious food and water supplies. As mentioned earlier, members of the Rip clan are audacious and seek challenge everywhere, summarized in the flavor text of Blister Beetle. Warriors of the Rip clan wear their beetle acid scars proudly, even modifying clothing and armor to better display the trophy. Perhaps the most notorious is Clan Neltoth, whose shamans embrace potent death magic, animating corpses such as the zombie dragon Scourge of Neltoth. Their power on display in Morbid Bloom and the ability of Marin of Clan Neltoth. Scavenging and scurrying at the bottom of Jun's chain are various small lizards, fungal plants, crocodiles, drakes, and innumerable expendable goblin tribes. Jun's goblins live deep within mountain caverns and atop jagged peaks where they can maintain close proximity to their winged gods, the dragons. Goblin society is structured around their deities, whom they worship and to whom they provide a steady stream of food through ritual sacrifice. Goblins often sacrifice dozens to appease the dragons and gain strength from their gifts. In fact, a noble death in ritual to feed their overlords is something cherished by most goblins. We see this in cards like Dragon's Herald and Dragon Fodder, whose flavor text reads, Goblins journey to the sacrificial peaks in pairs so that the rare survivor might be able to relay the details of the other's grisly demise. Jun's goblins are aggressive, unpredictable, reckless, and impetuous. They have no concern for their own well-being, no thought for the past or future. They embrace the liberating passion of the present. Ignorant of their own plight, they hunt and give battle to all manner of foe, regardless of size or strength. This sentiment is beautifully encapsulated in the flavor text of Goblin Death Raiders. Every once in a while, when they aren't getting incinerated in lava, crushed under rock slides, or devoured by dragons, goblins experience moments of unmitigated glory in battle. For a race that sees sacrifice as the highest honor and where death brings glory, it's exceedingly difficult to find a goblin that has passed of old age. There are myriad creatures that fill niches within Jun's elaborate and deadly ecosystems. Other notable creatures lurking within the steaming jungles include a race of large lizards unique to the Shard called Thrynax. These beasts are highly adaptable and vicious. Some grow stronger with each kill, as we see in Scarland Thrynax and Bloodspore Thrynax. They scavenge what they can and prey on the weak. Others, such as the Sprouting Thrynax, are best fit for prey themselves, heard in the flavor text. The vast network of predation on Jund has actually caused some strange creatures to adapt to being eaten. Jund is also host to a wide variety of elementals spawned from its surging mana and instilled with the violent temperament of the landscape. As we have discussed, some are birthed of shamanic magic and directed in their devastation by powerful mages, but many more are pure expressions of Jund's explosive nature. We see their fire in the illustration of Bloodpyre Elemental whose flavor text reads, Elementals born of Jund are as cruel and unstable as the plane itself. While the rock slide elemental embodies the deadly mountain peaks and their sturdy but unpredictable demeanor. Others, like the tar fiend and massive lord of extinction, draw their power from pestilence, death, and the bottomless bogs found deep below Jund's canopy. A uniting concept on the Shard of Jund is resilience in death, strength in consumption. It's only natural in a world shaped by hunger and need that some evolve towards expendability, towards the fate of prey, while others grow towards premier predation. Two mechanics marry this concept and creatures beautifully. The first is an abundance of fodder. Many creatures on Jund are not only prepared for death, but use it as a means of propagation. We've seen this in the aforementioned Sprouting Thrynax, but other species the likes of the Tukatung Thalid and Mitotic Slime also generate creature tokens when they die, ensuring continuation of their species. The second is the hunger of the predator manifest in Jun's Devour mechanic. 
This is the insatiable drive, the base instinct and unadulterated violence of the shard, where everything is prey to something and only the strong survive. These creatures flourish with each kill and many, like the Hellkite Hatchling and Mycoloth, grant new or powerful abilities once placated. Dragons, Viashino, Hellions, Worms, the Apex Predators all support this mechanic, which is fueled by the plentiful prey skittering about. With the conflux of Alara, shards have come crashing into another and merged once more to form a single plane. This has led to explosive, creative, violent interactions between worlds that have evolved in isolation and bereft of two colors of mana. On Jund, white and blue mana surge, bringing intelligence and order to the wildlands. Cards like Sky Clan Thrash, Glory Scale Viashino, and Mycoid Shepherd highlight Jun's ability to adapt and the willingness of its denizens to be shaped by mana foreign to them. The extent to which this reforms Jund as a whole is summarized in the Shepherd's flavor text. As pure mana flooded across the shards, it brought a sense of unity even to Jun's vicious food chain. But just as its creatures bring unity and thought to Jun's landscape, so too do they export its raw passion and reputation for brutal violence to the other shards. The elves of Naya embrace Jun's deadly ecosystems and revere as gods the dragons soaring across the skies, seen in cards like God Tracker of Jund and Bloodbraid Elf. Bant's knights, bound by duty, honor, and order, are ill-prepared for the bellicose chaos of Jun's predators, which we see in the illustration of Giant Ambush Beetle, where a massive insect hunts unwitting knights, and in the flavor text of Jund Hackblade, which reads, The knights were halfway through their pre-combat rites before they realized the foul brute meant to start without them. Jund, a savage land replete with dangers and pulsing with raw emotion, a primeval landscape shaped by molten lava, surging with uncompromising growth and violence. Its creatures bear strong vitality, themselves transformed into ferocious and insatiable predators mirrored by their environs. It's a shard of freedom, of beauty, of bloodshed. With the conflux of Alara, Jun must question its foundational ideals as its landscape and creatures are rocked by a tumultuous influx of novel mana and reforming ideas. Ever adaptable, its dragons and beasts may find new grounds over which to range. Its primitive tribes may embrace thoughts of civilization. One point remains certain. Jun will retain its fiery chaos, for which it is known. Thanks so much for watching and listening to The Shard of Jund Explained, and stay tuned for future episodes in which we'll explore the remaining shards of Alara. But now I want to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts on Jund's ecosystem, which creature is your favorite, as well as suggestions for future videos in the comments below. And if you're a fan of lore and storytelling, be sure to subscribe to the channel, check out the podcast or the blog, where content is uploaded frequently. A huge shout out to all of my supporters over on Patreon. Your patronage means the world to me and helps the channel grow and improve. If you're interested in becoming a lore luminary for access to me, a great community, written scripts, and early video drops, check out patreon.com slash thelorebrarians to learn more. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.